leg of our virtual tour of Pompeii. In this tour, we will tour the Villa of Mysteries that is outside the walls of Pompeii. So right now we're overlooking Pompeii. Let's get a, a quick overview of where we are. Um, so here's the outline of Pompeii itself. And during our um, first part of the tour, we came in through the Marine Gate, and here is the Forum of Pompeii, the two main theaters, and then also the amphitheater. So today we're going to look at the Villa of Mysteries. The Villa of Mysteries is actually located outside of Pompeii, and you can see it right here. And there's a road. So right here is the kind of the gate for Pompeii, and this road went down directly towards the villa. So if you remember from past um, tours, Romans did not allow um, the dead to be buried within city limits. So most of the roads going into Pompeii or Rome or any other major Roman city would usually be lined by cemeteries. So through here is a major cemetery. If we get a little closer, we actually can see some of the tombs right here. You see they're lining the road. And if we get in there in street view, we should be able to see a couple. And we're not going in. Oh, there we go. So as it kind of comes into focus, you'll see there's tombs all along this road. And again, this direction would be into Pompeii. And again, some more tombs here. Another tomb. And then down here, if we went down this direction, that would take us towards the Villa Mystery. So let's exit out a little bit here. Um, and you'll see there's also another villa right here that's impartially excavated. It's not as in good condition as the Villa of Mysteries, but you'll see they're pretty close by. So the Villa of Mystery is right here. Um, see if I can get a different orientation here. There we go. So the Villa of Mysteries is a well-preserved ancient Roman villa on the outskirts of Pompeii. Um, it's famous for a series of frescoes in one room that is usually thought to show the initiation of a young woman um, into a Greco-Roman mystery cult. So it's kind of like a, a um, secret cult that some Romans worshipped. Um, this villa was covered much like the rest of Pompeii in meters of ash and other volcanic material. Uh, but the, this villa only sustained minor damage uh, when it was buried. So the roofs um, you see here is all new. When the volcano erupted, this would have been burned away, and then the ash would have fallen on into the interior. But the ash ended up preserving all the walls, all the paintings, um, and also the interiors of the rooms. Again, anything that was wood or paper would have been burned away, but anything that was um, made out of a solid, like a rock or marble or brick structure, would have been uh, preserved. So this villa had around 60 rooms, and by the time of the eruption, it was already 200 years old. So when this villa was built, it actually was built um, during the Roman Republic before it collapsed and became what we call the Roman Empire. So... Uh, if you look at the first part of the villa, you'll see it's kind of symmetrical in how it's laid out. You'll see it has a garden on each side. It has kind of a walkway on each side. And then it has a, a couple of rooms on each side, a center walkway or entranceway, and then an atrium here. So it's very symmetrical, and that would have been the original part of the house. But as over the um, years that it existed, other parts of it on the back side were added. And you see they're not as symmetrical as the front. So a villa is basically the equivalent of a countryside mansion. So it worked as both a wealthy estate, but also worked as a farm. Um, it had all the trappings of wealth. So um, it had rooms for dining, uh, bathing relaxing it had had gardens you'll see the gardens are kind of right here along the perimeter and there's also gardens on the interior um, uh, but the, the rooms also had um, areas for pressing wine uh, grape into wine it had large kitchens and also it had a storage area for grain um, it also had stables too for horses so let's actually go in here and explore the villa a little bit So 
So we're now inside the villa, and where we are standing right now, this is what would have been called a peristyle. So you'll see it's a kind of an outdoor walkway that's covered by a roof, and it has kind of a garden in the center. So since this was a villa, it was already surrounded by lots of um, outdoor gardens and farmland. So the, the garden in the, in the center of the peristyle is actually quite small. When you go into the, the domus or the houses inside Pompeii, usually the peristyle is a little bit larger because they don't have outdoor land. Um, but you'll see as we kind of look around here is that you'll see the original plaster is still kind of hanging off the walls. It would have been a very deep red. Um, so it's kind of a, you know, um, you'll see a lot of the original um, plaster is still there. And you'll see they have kind of, they try to uh, make it look like in some areas where it has like a column, which you see over here as well, to kind of reflect um, the outdoor column with the inside column. Now, when you see like a large doorway, most likely this would have had a wooden door um, here. So it would have had something to um, either a double Dutch door or one main door to open up through here. And again, this all the wood would have been burned away during the eruption. Let's move on to a different area. And we're going to move on to this area right here, another part of this peristyle. There we go. So in this part of the peristyle, I'm going to zoom out a little bit. Um, again, you'll see a lot of the original plasters hanging off the wall. Um, you'll see there's part of the um, indoor, kind of like the, out, the outdoor garden part of the peristyle. So the peristyle was an important space because it provided access to the outdoors, um, even within the middle of the villa. Many of the rooms in the villa had doors opening into the peristyle, which, um, along with the main atrium, is served as the core of the villa. So again, this is all covered up. It would have protected you from the rain and elements, but also would allow you easy access to the um, outside as well. Um, and again, you will see a lot of the original plasters hanging off the wall, and it would have been a very deep red. And you can see that there as well. And again, a lot of the houses on Pompeii, the plaster has been destroyed, but in the Villa Mysteries, you can see it's still pretty well preserved. Let's move on to our next location, which will be the interior courtyard. So we're going to go in through here. So I'm going to zoom out a little bit here. So you see it's a very kind of small courtyard. Um, it's not very big, but it did provide outdoor access where you could easily get to it without having to actually go outside the building. Um, and basically, uh, the villa was an attempt to recapture the lifestyle of, of rural Rome when it was still a republic. Um, during and after the rise of the Roman Empire, the countryside underwent significant changes. So there were civil wars at the end of the republic where Romans were fighting other Romans, and Pompey actually revolted against Rome at one point. Um, and it ruined many estates. And for a while, the countryside was a pretty dangerous place to live. Uh, but under the empire, things kind of came, kind of um, became more secure, and we call that the Pax Romana. Um, and urban dwellers or people from the, the city, so people who lived in Pompeii, some of them who were wealthier ended up building or taking over villas that were outside the city and the countryside. Um, and a lot of them bought land from small landowners and made large um, farms. Sometimes we call them these large farms latifundia. So um, as you can see, the, um, we're outside the peristyle. And you'll see there's columns. They, and, and the urban um, domus or houses, the par these columns would go all the way to the ground. But in here, you'll see that they included a wall to kind of um, separate it from the outside space. Um, this area right here, where you see it's kind of like a, uh, a stairway going down, down here would have been a uh, wine cellar or storage for, uh, for food or grain. Let's move on to our next area. And our next area is going to be right here. If 
I can get my computer to work. There we go. And again, we're still in the peristyle. And so you'll see this peristyle is a rather modest compared to many of um, the peristyles we, you might see in their urban houses of Pompeii. The main thing that I mentioned earlier was um, in an urban house, these um, columns would have gone all the way down to the floor and you wouldn't have had this wall. And again, on the ins inside here would have been a pleasure garden or an ornamental garden. And again, you can see all of the um, red plaster as well. So now we're now going to move into the uh, main atrium for the house. And before we go in there, you'll see it has um, an oculus in the center. And then they have, you'll see uh, what they call an impluvium, which is kind of a small pool to capture rainwater that came down through here. So let's go into this area of the house. Let me zoom out a little bit here. Um, what you'll see, again, you'll see that this room is a little bit different with the plaster. You'll see they actually tried to um, put some decoration and kind of like um, some columns and so forth. Again, the Romans didn't have wallpaper, so instead what they would do is they'd lay plaster down and then paint murals or prescos on their wall. So that, that, that was their equivalent of uh, wallpaper. So the atrium um, was kind of a main central point of the house. This would have been kind of the main area um, of, of this villa. And you can see at the very top here, we have this inward sloping roof. It kind of slopes downward, and we come to this, this um, main kind of like I call it oculus, but they also would have called it a compluvium. And rainwater would have, would have come down through here and it would have landed in this pool. And this pool was very shallow. It wasn't made for swimming or anything. It was more of a water feature to kind of add some beauty to the room. It also would have been used to cool the room because this would have, um, the water would have helped um, cool the room, kind of like a modern air conditioner to a certain degree. And also with some of the domus um, impluviums, sometimes they would have what they uh, call a cistern or a well or um, kind of like a, a barrel vault type structure underneath the impluvium to collect rainwater um, for bathing or drinking sometimes. So you'll see this main um, atrium had a main doorway, but also two other small doors. You see this one has reconstructed um, wooden doors here, but these would have all been um, large wooden doors hanging off these areas. And again, you can see the plaster and the decorations on there and so forth. So the next part of the house we're going to go to, we're going to go to um, the actual room where this house gets its name. So let's move on to there. So this room is um, the room that contains a mural um, and that represents a um, kind of a, a mystery cult initiation ceremony. So this room is how the Villa of Mysteries got its name. Um, if we zoom out a little bit, you'll see it's quite a large room. Um, this would have been used as a dining room or what they call a triclinium. So you, you would have had your guests here. You would have had um, your dinner in this room. It's about 15 by 15, so it's quite large. You'll see it has um, a great checkered um, floor pattern here. And then you'll see it has a small doorway here to, to get into the room. And then on the other side, you'll see a window. And then if you go right to the back side, you'll see there's a large um, area that would have been overlooking um, the gardens outside. And also you would have been able to see the ocean from here um, as well. So at the time, um, at this time in the Roman Empire, there were uh, mystery cults all over the empire. Um, 
these mystery cults were not official Roman religions, and many of the cults had a secret initiation rites. Um, sometimes early Christians were lumped together with the other mystery cults because Christians were sometimes secretive in their worship as well for good reason. Um, but historians believe this mural depicts a dying a nice and nice and cult ritual. So let's take a closer look at um, the mural here. You'll see it's th on three walls. One, two, and then three, and it's broken up by that window. So let's kind of go through the different um, areas of this mural. So the, this first person here in the mural, she represents a bride. She's kind of wearing um, a veil. And, and how the room is set up, it kind of looks like she's coming through the doorway, if that makes sense. So you'll see how her arm is kind of um, resting on her her uh, her hip, and she's kind of holding her her veil. Um, she's covered from head to toe. Um, historians think that she probably re represented an uh, aristocratic figure or someone wealthy, maybe the owner of the house, um, and she might have represented a bride. Um, so the idea of this mural is, is that this mural represents a mystical marriage between the bride, who is right here, and the god Dionysus. Uh, Dionysus was the ancient Greek god of wine. Um, wine making, grape cultivation, fertility, ritual, madness, theater, and religious ecstasy. So Dionysus actually appears on this next wall over here. And so we'll kind of go through each area of this. So um, next to the, the, the bride is a standing uh, boy who is buck naked. He's totally naked. And you'll see he's kind of reading a scroll. Um, and Historians think this might represent some form of litur liturgy or ritual reading of religious texts. So as the bride enters, the um, boy is reading um, some form of religious text. Um, behind the boy is a female figure. She is sitting. You'll see her right here. Um, and then next to the sitting female is another female who's carrying a tray of food. And we think, think the food might be like cakes or some type of figs. And most likely this person might have either represented a slave or um, another bride that is uh, moving on through the mural. Now, one thing to take note of is we look at the mural, you'll see that they try to use an optical illusion to make it look like that the floor keeps on moving along. So you'll see it kind of makes the room look bigger than it really is, which is kind of a neat optical illusion. Um, this type of room is painted in a style called the second style. Second style Roman painting used optical illusions to make a room look bigger or make the viewer feel like they're part of the mural. So you kind of look down, it looks like the room kind of continues on um, like one big optical illusion. So it kind of feels like you're actually in the initiation ritual for this the ceremony. So you're gonna see next to the woman carrying the uh, the cakes, you'll see um, some people sitting around, around a desk or a table. Um, they're lifting like looks like some type of like a, like a drape or, or a curtain of some something to kind of show. Um, but you really can't see what's going on back there. So we're not quite sure what the, what they're trying to show. But the cool thing is right next to these women is what we call a satyr. So this person is it's kind of drunk. They're leaning against the wall. Um, they're playing uh, what they call a, a harp or a lyre. And a satyr was basically a drunken woodland god. Um, they would usually party with Dionysus. Um, and so this satyr looks actually pretty old. So he's an older satyr. And if you remember from the, uh, the tour where we um, kind of looked at the sex industry of Pompeii, um, there were satyrs in that one as well. Um, so satyrs have the upper body of a man and a lower body of a, of a goat. And the next grouping, uh, which you really can't see here very well, so I'm just going to go on to another screen that shows us better, and you'll see this has a better view of everything. But this next grouping, um, you'll see there are some people playing uh, some music, and then you'll see some goats here as well that are being fed. But right next to um, 
these people is a woman and she looks like she's startled or, or frightened or surprised you'll see her hands kind of like up like what's going on and she's looking over her shoulder she's pulling her um her kind of her cloak over her head so you can see she's kind of surprised or frightened not sure what's going on and so we'll go back to the 3d look here you will see she's looking back and she's kind of surprised by what's going on right here you'll see there's a person holding a mask so this guy is kind of like scaring her a little bit she's like what is going on so if you go to, to a zoom in, in picture of this mural right here you'll see um there's the woman who's been frightened here's the young man holding a mask and it probably was a theater mask and then you'll see some other people we're not quite sure what this globe is or i'm not sure if it's a bowl where this person is trying to feed this person alcohol we're just not quite sure um but right next to these people right here is the god dionysus and you'll see he's kind of late leaning back on um, on a woman's kind of like lap. Um, Dionysus is hammered. He's drunk. He's usually portrayed this way. He's the god of wine. So it makes sense for him to be kind of sloshed. Um, and he's leaning into the lap of um, his lover. So according to legend, he had a mortal lover. And you'll see she has her arm around him, kind of holding him in, in an embrace. And she has some wine here. And he's kind of like looking up at her. You really can't see her because that part of the mural is destroyed. And then the next figure you'll see um, right here is pulling up on a drape. You'll see there's a drape right there. And underneath that drape, we're not quite sure what this is. Some historians think it's like a phallus like or a penis. Um, and I've heard some other historians say this might be a representation of Vesuvius the volcano, which you can see from outside of the villa. Um, but obviously, it's, it's, this drape was meant to hide something. Uh, we're just not quite sure what it was. Um, next to this drape, you'll see there's a, a winged figure. Um, and she's looking over her shoulder over to here. You'll see there's a person kind of cowering. And if you look in her hand, you'll see she has a whip. And she's whipping this figure over here. And this other figure is kind of cowering. You'll see this woman who's cowering is trying to be is protected by this other person from being whipped by the winged creature here. Um, so let's kind of go back to the 3D view here, and you'll see there's the um, the wind creature, the woman being whipped. You'll see the window. So let's kind of look at this panel right here. When we look at this panel, this window will be removed. Oh, wrong one. There we are. So again, here is the woman that's being whipped by the wind creature on the other wall. But then we see a woman who's kind of celebrating. She's naked. She has kind of like a cloak on her or a drape. Um, and she's dancing and she has symbols in her hands. So we're not quite sure what this is supposed to represent. Um, but it is. it does seem to be kind of a happier scene than from this one right here. And then right here would have been the window. Um, they, they took the window out to kind of unify this for our purposes. Um, and then you see the next... Um, part of the mural you'll see there's kind of like a cherub a winged creature and holding a mirror up to this woman who's brushing her hair you see she's brushing her hair looking at the mirror we think this person behind her might be a slave who's helping her out um, historians think this might represent the other bride who's on the other side of the mural and so basically the whole part of this is the bride getting married married and going through the whole initiation ritual and then she comes through here and you'll see she's now kind of married and more relaxed and over here you'll see there's the um the, uh, the bride wearing her veil sitting down and looking at the entire scene um so basically, historians think this whole um, room, whoops, wrong room, there we go, um, represents the entire um, ritual ceremony for this cult. And again, it, they think it's a ritual marriage between the homeowner to Dionysus, the god of wine. Um, in the end, we have no written records for this religion, so we have no idea what the rituals were, um, how they practiced, and so forth. All we can guess is based upon what we see in this mural. So this ends our tour of the Villa of Mysteries. Take care.